Welcome back to the Tapes Archive podcast, where we release interviews that have never been heard before. In this episode, we have Dave Matthews. At the time of this interview in 1996, Matthews was 29 years old and out on tour supporting his third album, Crash. In the interview, Dave talks about the making of the band's latest album, his thoughts on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the first time he and his band performed live, and how his fancy footwork is more of an affliction than dancing. Also in the interview, Mark says something to Dave that has never been said to him before. As always, we have music critic Mark Allen at the helm conducting the interview. If you'd like to support the show, please like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. There, we post other content and information not available on the podcast. If you'd like to read the transcripts for any of our episodes, please head over to our website at thetapesarchive.com. We'll jump into the interview after a quick word from our sponsors. The Tapes Archive is proud to be sponsored by the true crime documentary, Dead Man's Line. You've got a hundred armed officers around here trying to get a shot at me. I dared him to shoot me. I didn't go down there to be a buffoon. I went down there for vengeance. And God God, I'll have vengeance. In 1977, Tony Karitsis kidnapped a mortgage broker and held him captive for three days. For the first time ever, the media was able to cover the event live. To some, Tony was a hero. To others, he was a crazed thug. Dead Man's Line. The true story of Tony Karitsis. This award-winning film is available exclusively on Amazon Prime. One last thing before we get to the interview, the Tapes Archive podcast is a proud member of Osiris Media, a global community connecting passionate fans with podcasts and experiences about artists and topics you love. Thanks for tuning in, and now it's time to open the vault. I'm glad to hear it from you. Where are you today? I'm in Virginia Beach. I'm oh. in my hotel room, staring out of... Over, um, over, uh, let me pull my, pull my sock on, uh, over the Atlantic, thinking, wow. Are, are you, is Virginia Beach anywhere close to home? Yeah, it's about three and a half hours. Oh, so I came over here yesterday, spent the night in the hotel, went down and saw some friends of mine play at a, uh, a band called Agents of Good Roots, and then today we're going to do this, do an amphitheater here. Well, let me start up by asking you, you, in the bio you described the new record as more aggressive, more sexy, more loud, more soft. To me, I, I thought more focused and maybe makes more sense. At least the, that's sort of the way I heard it. Do you think that's... Uh... Yeah, I think, I, th I think so. I, mean, I, was, I was, It's always difficult to hear yourself quoted because I always think it's partly true and then partly not true you know, or you know or it's it, what's what you said but it's sort of cut, cut around I think I, I wouldn't agree with you I don't it's hard, it's hard for me to know because I'm inside looking out exactly what it looks like to be on the outside looking in but I know that this album had a lot more there's a lot more ease about it and there was a lot more n spontaneity in, in the creation of it and we were in a circle the first album we sort of did like in a conventional way we did a uh, click track and guitar, drums, bass, and then overdubbing things. And and so we, we sort of made a... I really liked the first record. I really do. I was really proud of it. But I feel like this one had more of us in it. We didn't use a click track. We just got in a circle and we all played. Boom. And then and that was the foundation of the album was live. And in between the lines, which which aren't there anymore, I mean, you can't, you can't hear them, but we just jam. We did a lot of jamming and a lot of playing uh, and impro improvising and inventing new parts for songs and inventing new sections for songs. So, um, so yeah, I think, you know, being in a circle and laying this, this thing down, put, having vocals on it from the, you know, from the beginning and having violin and saxophone and uh, what you hear on the album, a lot of that is even, is even what we did in the, in the first take. So I think in that sense, there's an immediacy about it. And then also because we were in a circle together and because we were playing in that environment, that there's a sort of a con continuity about the album. There's something, there's a beginning and there's an end. When I when I listened to uh, Under the Table and Dreaming the first time, I, I just thought to myself, I, 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 I had a real hard time understanding it and understanding what you were doing. And it took me, I, I guess... When I saw you play at Farm Aid, it, it started to make some sense. And now that I, you know, now this this record just makes much more sense to me. So I, I know uh, what you, I, I know what you mean. I, for, I know. Uh, sorry, carry on. Yeah, no, say? please, no, go ahead. Because I, I, I want I, I 
I, I'm wondering if I'm even remotely close to that. If that's the way you think of it, or yeah, if it's I, just well, I, well I, I think of when I when I under the table and dreaming, it's sort of like I don't know a, a picture of me in a silver jacket. I don't wear silver jackets, but it's sort of that's the way it looks to me. It's shiny and it's you know I don't. Uh, whereas this album, I feel like I could sit with this album more. When we were done with Under the Table and Dreaming, I I never listened to it from beginning to end. I don't think ever. I think we finished it, mixing it, and it was like, goodbye. And uh, not because I hated it, because because I was done. And I guess when we got to the end, I was, I know I was psyched about it, but maybe not as psyched as I, I am about this one. Because you know, I haven't listened to it recently, but once we were finished it, I really, I really listened to it a lot. And I, you know, and, and scrutinized it, and I feel like it seems like, to me, I can look at it almost uh, more clearly than the other one. So I guess in a way that's an agreement with what you're saying about mm -hmm. the, the, there's, there being a, more of a sense in it, you know. Yeah, and it, so it, it's interesting to me that um, even though you were playing in a circle, you said it seems like like parts would be rewritten, that, uh, that, that the songwriting process is very fluid for you. Am I correct about that? Yeah, much well? more on this album. There was a lot of lyrics on, that weren't finished. And, and uh, you know, in, in the last moment, we might flip sections around. And I think maybe that was one of the reasons that it became clear, it became more uh, tied together, was because I would be working on the the lyrics for, for Crash and the lyrics for um, Let You Down and the lyrics for uh, Say Goodbye. And I know what each one is about, but the, the fact that they maybe that they were all being done, or too much as well, you know, the fact they were all being done sort of simultaneously, maybe that's, maybe the, 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 it's a reflection is a little clearer. Yeah, that seems to be in line with the way I was thinking about it, so I'm glad about that. I feel more comfortable about that. I hear a lot of... Excuse me, just... Okay, hey, hey, excuse me. Can you keep it down just a little bit? Thanks. I hear... A, uh, this is maybe an odd question. I hear a lot of car sounds on your records, or the feeling of cars driving around. And Do you hear that at all? Do you, is that intentional at all, or is that just well, something... I, uh, there's people. That's a cool... That's a cool... There, there's, there, there's something that drives in it, I guess. I don't know if we put any in there. There's just this kind of occasional confusion, or occasional uh, crowded highways or traffic jams kind of feeling just with how the music's moving. I don't know. I sometimes, I sometimes feel like it, it's sort of like a crowded hall as well, recorded from a chandelier above everything else. I don't know It's it, where, where that might come up. It's an interesting idea. I don't... I don't know. Well, I, well, drive in, drive out is an obvious. Place, yeah, it's an obvious one. But, but there are times, and and I don't know what the song is. I, one of the songs you played at Farm Aid had a very, almost sounded like cars honking at each other, and and I get this this you know very stop and go, very motion conscious sound when I listen to your music, and that's it's definitely something that I I, I think it's just the, the combination of all of us. This sort of a circular. Uh, uh, feel around the music, some sort of change, something, some unexpected ways of dealing with rhythm, which keeps it more like a tide than like a house, or something like that, or more like the movement of uh, maybe, as you say, of, of cars or crowds rather than, or like a river. There is movement. I think, like in the song, like Crash, that when I and and it was funny because I'd written the song Crash, and we and then we recorded it, and then we we're finishing the lyrics, and then realized. Uh, Wow, it sounds like waves almost. Mm -hmm. No, but and then we, I think Steve even threw some waves in at the end yeah. but, that we recorded down the, uh, off the coast of New York. But but it's uh, it's it, it, that was that was that was sort of surprising to me that 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 the song came out and used the words and the references to water with, and I never really thought about it that much. So that that the movement in there, I don't know why it is. I think I have to just give credit to the players and to the way the songs. Unfold. Well, it's it's interesting because it's. So, I mean, one of the things that I that I've come to enjoy about your music is that it's so. I mean, it's so. Uh, maybe it is two four and four four. I don't know, but it's it's so not that way. It doesn't feel that way. You know, it's it's very. The times seem odd, or or they can shift uh, very quickly and uh, and without warning. And I I, I guess that's uh, maybe that's what I'm partially what I'm hearing. But mm -hmm. uh, but I, I just find that that kind of fascinating it's so different from what everybody else does and from standard uh, pop songs yeah you know those you know those uh 
Uh, thank you very much first, but you know when you go to one of those perspective the, I, I think I saw it in the in the in the Richmond Science Museum they play with perspective so you look through this um I even saw it in a video once I think I saw an idea um, I mean someone used one of these things but you look into a hole in the wall and you see this room on the other side but then and then you have a friend walk into the room and actually it's you know the whole perspective of it is is an illusion. It actually isn't a square, but in fact, or a box room. It's actually like this, you know, small and 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 shorter, and and there's the illusion of a big room, but it's actually a tiny little sort of cone-shaped thing. And so I think the honor of playing with with Carter and, and all of us and then playing together is that how easily we you know we can deal with a, a song in six eight or deal with a song in uh, you know a waltz. Or deal with, or jump back and forth from six eight to four four, or make a song that that sort of sounds like, a, that, that, or a lot of songs that are just four four, but with just the way that we deal with them makes them seem odd, you know, when they're actually just as straightforward time signatures as any, but just maybe the way that we can emphasize them makes them sound less that way. So much of it is being having people. That being working with people that are playful with music because otherwise they get bored and we'd kill each other <laughs> um, so that people will stretch those things if, if for no other reason than to challenge themselves I gotta think that at some point in your career that you've had some record company guy go come up to you and go listen you know if you played it a little straighter you know if you just did it a little bit more straightforward uh, you'd sell millions of records right? and you've had that haven't you I think there's there's been that there's been that I think that was mostly at the beginning before we were signed that was sort of the reaction that we got right you know like what do you you know well there's just no place for this music it's too clever it's too this and then I was like it's not clever it's just it's just a little quirky it's a little eccentric but it's not trying to outdo anyone it's trying to it's trying to hit people in the heart so I mean we got some of that reaction but a lot of people you know uh, the most of the industry arrived when we had a really solid following so they arrived and there was some following in Virginia and, and then when we moved up you know we started playing up in New York they'd come and see us there and then we'd have this following there of people who were just rocking so I get a lot of the industry people sort of got caught in that too like whoa that's weird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Look, they, they like it, even though it's in that weird time signature. Um, and and the industry is, it's a very strange thing. I'm just fascinated by it. I, I know that a lot of friends that I have in it might not find me quite as fascinating and attractive were I on the downslide. You know, I certainly think it's, it's, a, it's a fickle industry that, that doesn't have that friendships that have been forged in this industry are very easily thrown back into the furnace. Well, that's a good thing to always remember cause, <laughs> because it is a business that, that, that can be pretty cruel to you, especially. Yeah, you know, I think and I, I'm, I'm always expecting it. I mean, you sell three million uh, plus records of uh, a record that I'm presuming did not cost a great deal to make. Everybody's going to love you. I guess you, you don't have to look any further than like the spin doctors to see how, how quickly things can fall apart. Let me ask you about, about some of the songs. Um, can you can you tell me about Cry Freedom? I think that's a really beautiful song. Anyway. It started, uh, uh, there's the obvious uh, title reference to the film Attenborough did, which I wasn't completely crazy about the film, nor was I wild about the, the book. I think Peter Woods was the author. You know, certain from that book, I learned a lot about Biko and from you know, my, my family and my mother. And just a, a very, very terrible story. But it start, and so the song started sort of not singing about Biko, but just about some sort of struggle and the obvious image of some sort of nation with the ideas of flags and resistance. But then I felt like that it, it just a little address to that was good if I wasn't being, du- you know, direct and was ambiguous. So I made the song be more about that phrase that I like a lot, the cry freedom, so that so but it, it, there are many different places that that comes from. The internal struggle, too, to somehow bring the what's inside of a person and what's outside of a person together or somehow bring make them similar, you know, which is something that we all, I think we all try and do. I try and make what's inside of me, what's me on the inside and what's me on the outside as similar as possible so that I don't go bananas. <laughs> um, 
and and you, and you sort of have to compromise that a lot. So I think that's sort of the, the thing that was going on in that song, the, the idea that, and that even when things were improved to protect yourself, you know, the, the, the image of the girl being taken from a place, but then really put in put into another place, a place that's uh, I guess that's it's, that's closed in and that's ignorant, uh, that's going to just a dark place, it's a place. Uh, this, the situation's not really improved. So just these, these I don't know, I just, it, was, it was a song, I guess, just about freedom, which is a word that I don't think has the respect it deserves, even certainly specifically in this country. We use it loosely and easily, like we use love. I want to love you tonight, baby. You know, well, it's, it's a loose interpretation of the word. And I think when we say, this country, one of the only free countries, or countries with freedom, or countries that has achieved freedom, a country founded in freedom and justice, is sort of a loose interpretation of the word, because freedom certainly implies a, a little more lenience than we experience in this country. And, I, and I've always thought uh, that, and it's a mood that I, I sense in South Africa, that freedom is something, right now at least, freedom is something something you aim at, but something that's always on the horizon. And that's no way that you can get there. So that's the fight. The fight is, there's the goal. That's, that's what we want. We want freedom. So people are free to create, and people are free to think, and people are free to drink, and people are free to smoke, and people are free to alter their minds, or people are free to love who they like or people are free to live where they like or do what they like and or talk the way that they like and so you aim at that and then you just keep chipping away and adding more bricks on to that you just add more 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 stones to that pile of things that can give you freedom but that you can never get there because it's impossible because but once you sort of resign yourself to saying that's the goal but it's an unreachable goal then it becomes a sort of almost a religion without a god, where the god become, a, a, in a way, a righteous goal. Well, don't you think, uh, I mean, the freedom you talk about, I mean, I th in, in this country, I think it exists, but I think it's also a matter of, you, you have that freedom, but you also have the freedom, but other people have the freedom to make your life a living hell if you, if you practice your freedoms. You know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, but, I think, but I think in many senses, this country is discouraged. And, and, it's, and it's something that happens with governments, certainly with governments all over the world, the, 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 the idea is to perpetuate themselves. So rather than perpetuate themselves by being, by saying, okay, well, let's just give every bit of any information to everyone as aggressively as we can. You know, let's educate our children on every level, you know, so they know Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, they know, they know Nelson Mandela, they know Fidel Castro, they know Karl Marx, they know Jesus Christ. They've got to, we've got to educate our children on every philosophy that we can so that when they leave, they've got open minds. And in a way, that would perpetuate a very creative, very, and that's, it's, you know, it's almost... A sense there, but I feel much more, much more often there's the urge to say, don't give them that. But the thing I love the most about this country is that I am free to say whatever I like about it. And I don't necessarily jump on that horse as, as much as I should, but I have complaints, and I think it's good to complain. You know, I think it's good to complain, but I think it would be good for us to uh, listen to someone like Nelson Mandela more. When did you come to this country? I've been back and forth all my life. Oh, okay. I've grown up here um, and grown up in South Africa. And my father was a physicist, so we came here, and, and we, we lived in England for the same reason, and back here, and then he, he passed away, went back to South Africa, and I moved back to the States, so it's sort of back and forth all my life. Were you born here? Or born, born, in the, born in South Africa. Tell me about Proudest Monkey. Is that about you? I, I, I didn't think it was. I thought it was just, initially, when I thought it was just like evolution, the idea of, uh, or at least uh, some sort of evolution from simple rural uh, or uh, uh, people to... to uh, is a uh, horn honking, uh, red light, green light, uh, cigarette butts, um, and urban debris uh, dwellers. And so uh, from cave dwellers to, to crowded dwellers. That's what I thought initially, but then when we got to the album, Steve Lillywhite said, that one, we should put this at the end of the album because it's a song about you guys. And I thought, wow. Now, in a, in a lot of ways, it does mean that more to me, because I guess, I guess the base it was coming from in my heart was kind of like that, this idea of, of being uh, quiet and, and having lots of time to stare, like Neanderthals, at the, at the stars, you know, 
and at the moons. And then, uh, but then now, now sort of not having as much time like that as I did and, and being sort of in, in the middle of something much more tumultuous than I would have expected it to be when I was sitting back dreaming. It sort of has that, that ring of, uh, boy, well, you know, what happened here? You know, I'm just, that success and everything that's happened to you in the last couple of years just seemed, you know, I thought maybe it was just kind of overwhelming. It, it, it you know, it is. And so, but I think that if I ever had been to an analyst, they'd probably say that that was a good way to deal with it. Yeah. yeah. You're right about it. <laughs> that's your feelings. Um, so I guess, you know, that's, that's how I did it. And I do miss that, you know, but I think uh, I do miss the, what I don't have, but, but everybody does. And I have a damn good job, so. Absolutely, yeah. So I'm, as far as jobs go, this is a good one, and, and I should try and keep it for as long as I can. Can you tell me how your singing style and your footwork style came about? I don't know about the footwork. That's more like an infliction. I don't know what happened there, because I see, you know, see videos of myself, and then I get kind of embarrassed. Because it uh, looks like I'm doing a Charleston. So I'll probably blame my mom or my grandmother. She probably did the Charleston. It's in my gene pool. And it doesn't always happen. See, if it was consistent, then it'd be cool. But instead, it's like they, they stay still and they just bop up and down like anybody's feet. And then all of a sudden, there's this complete spaz that takes place. And my knees start bending in strange directions. And then I'm like, what is happening to me there? <laughs> doesn't feel like that from where I'm looking, you know. Are you conscious of it when you're doing it? Not really, no. Because it's usually happening when I'm lost, yeah. you know, in, in, in the throes of passion or whatever. I, I just thought uh, shadow boxing. I wondered if you had boxed at some point. No, I haven't. That's All a good right. idea, though. Yeah. Said if I got biffed in the nose, I'd immediately quit. <laughs> That's right. It, you know, I... Uh, I've, right now, I have a, the first girlfriend that I've ever had that I've allowed to touch my nose, which is difficult when you're, you know, kissing and stuff like that. Uh -huh. Because I have I'm very sensitive about my nose, very uh, obsessed by. Wow. By because it, it, I don't know. I just I sneeze too damn easily. But I think this that it was it was something from my hay fever ridden childhood. My new girlfriend has been simultaneously outgrowing hay fever, so maybe. But she's free to squeeze and nibble my nose as she likes. So, but so much for boxing. But uh, <laughs> but uh, the uh, the, the, the singing style, yeah. I think. I, I don't know where it comes from, but I know I know I, I love melodies, and I know that that I like the feeling of the resonance of a voice in my head. It's a really cool thing to imitate sound, to imitate, to try and use when someone goes, what? To use that sound, or or, or somebody's angry, to people grind their teeth and to try and sound like somebody who's angry, but not only sound like somebody who's angry, but also sound like somebody who's hysterical when they're angry, you know? Not only be mean, but also be yodeling because you're so obsessed by, you know, you, you know when people get mad and they start shivering and, and those kind of things. And also, and like laughter and the, and the musical sound of laughter and trying to bring, and trying to turn that into melody and, and the sound of, of girls laughing in the toilets or, or the inspiration of the windscreen wipers. It's just, you know, all the, it's all things. I think, the, or I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know, basically what I think is I don't know where the hell my singing style comes from. Because for me, it all, I feel that it's, it seems derivative. It, it it seems like, well, not maybe not derivative, but it seems like a, it's the obvious melodies. They come out, so they seem like the, the obvious things to do. You know, I hum and hum and hum and ha and ha and ha as I'm writing a song, and then, then I find it, I'm like, oh, that's good, that's good. And then I sing along with it for a while, and it changes, and then I listen back to the tape, and I'm like, oh, that one over there was good, I forgot about that one. Let me go back there and let me resurrect them. So, so I don't know where it comes from. I know I listen to, you know, a lot of the Beatles, and I listen to a, a lot of Bob Marley and a lot of Marvin Gaye when I was growing up. And, and XTC, but I also listen to a lot of classical music because my parents always had it on. And, and, uh, well, XTC would, I, I could see that. I mean, none of the others I really hear, but XTC, okay, I could. And Joe Cocker. Uh, <laughs> no, I want to be, no, let's Joe, I was, I meant to say Joe Jackson. Uh, yeah. I love Joe Jackson. Yeah. He's got that wild, kind of crazy, I don't know, it's a, it's a very, it's almost obnoxious, his voice. But it's in the most beautiful way. How about Adrian Ballou? Yeah, I love Adrian Ballou. Yeah, okay. Because that, that's probably the closest comparison I can oh, draw. Oh, that's a nice thing to say. No one's ever said that. I would love that you said that to me. Because yeah. cause you use your voice as an instrument, and, and he does too, I think. Yeah, and he's really good at that, of that, of that sort of 
putting the the character behind the voice that he sings, right. behind the words he sings, Lone Rhinoceros, that whole album. The funny stuff is hysterical because it's just it's right there. Adidas and Eat, but they don't do Gekka. Well, Jack, I can't. Adidas and Eat, but they don't do Gekka. That's a great. I hear, uh, you know, because I hear the occasional thing of, in your music that reminds me of King Crimson, and uh, so I, and, but, but I guess it's the blue influence that. Uh, yeah, I love, I, I do love. Love King Crimson. You know, you've probably just had the, the most amazing last couple of years. I mean, it's probably like a head-spinning couple of years. And I always think that the people who, who have a, an incredible life-changing type of things happen to them, that they're, but, but over a broad period of time, there's always like one instance that happens where it lets you know that, that something, that your life has changed irrevocably. Was there, was there one thing that happened to you in the past couple of years where you realized, oh man, I am, I am famous, I am a star, I am whatever? You know, I, I run through it all, like really... Uh... I don't know if it's foolhardy or if I'm in denial or what it is. I'm. It's almost like a dream, you know, uh, in a weird way. Like not a dream come true, but like a sort of continual dream. <laughs> uh, there's so many. There's so many moments. Like the first, the first gig we had, I. It was it, that we ever played was it was on Earth Day, and we our band had been. It was a warmish day, but. But as the, as the afternoon, all these people were listening, all these people, and then the evening, we kept getting pushed forward because nobody knew who we were. They kept pushing us. We got to go to play another gig. We got to move on. This is a benefit. So everyone's trying to get out of there. And we ended up being the last band. And there was only 200 people there compared to at the beginning of the day when maybe there was a thousand, you know, which is a hell of a lot to have on the downtown mall of Charlottesville, Virginia. And, uh, but when we played, everybody danced. Of the 200 people that were left, every single one of them was dancing. And they never heard us before by the end of it. They were all dancing. That's sort of the, that's one of the biggest moments. Even though it was so early on, it was like, that we had all got in the, in the months prior to that when we'd been playing in the basement, my basement and Carter's basement, getting this, this uh, chemistry and this uh, click between us and, and being really excited about it. But I think that was like, that was... Uh, really surprising to all of us because none of it, none of us expected that to happen. None of us expected people to get up and, and start dancing and start celebrating around what we were doing. And what year was that? That had been 1990. Wow. Okay. And that was, it was only 200 people, but I think that's like the, that was sort of the thing that set us rolling and the thing that made us r survive two, two and a half years in a van or three years in a van, knee deep in, in vegetarian Big Macs and... <laughs> And uh, and rump steaks, you know, <laughs> and and rotting broccoli, and I'm sure there's something that walked past me there for a second. <laughs> what the hell came out the back there? Was that a rat, or is that a piece of? I don't know. It smells in here, you know. <laughs> it's too hot. Shut up. Don't talk to me. Don't make me stop this van. You know? <laughs> Uh, just two other things, I'll let you go. People, um, you know, I guess since they cannot lay, figure out a label for your music, I guess you get lumped in that kind of neo-hippie uh, Grateful Dead sound. Do you think that comparison is justified at all? I get what people are saying, you know. I can understand. You know, they're saying, we jam, we improvise, we move. Uh, the Dead didn't have a violin, did they? No. And they didn't move either. And they didn't move that much either, but... <laughs> But I, you know, I don't, it doesn't upset, the comparison doesn't upset me at all. And we do, we tour, and so I can see that. And but the, 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 re, the reason I think mostly that the comparison doesn't upset me is because uh, the first time that I ever saw the dead, and I think the first time all of us, except for Boy, who had seen them once, the first time we saw them was when we opened up for them at, in uh, Las Vegas this last summer. So it doesn't insult me, and I never really listened to them, I, not because I didn't didn't like them, but because I just never exposed myself to them, you know? <laughs> well, I guess pulling my pants down in front of them doesn't, doesn't involve a, <laughs> listen, no, I never listened to them growing up, so that's, it was just, it was just, that's, uh, that's what, uh, so it doesn't bother me for that reason. I'm like, cool, and I guess there's something we do that they do. Uh, I am really happy that we got to play with them before Jerry died, you know, it was, uh, not that we're on first name basis, but every, everyone seems to refer to him as Jerry. So I'll go ahead and do it too. Um, I just, you know, just because there was such a, 
uh, incredible culture, uh, uh, subculture that they that they had created that was uniquely American, but well, at the same time very much not not the mainstream. Mm-hmm. Although p- amazingly mainstream, at, at the same time it wasn't. It amazes you know you meet some lawyer and or an accountant and these are the last people you'd ever expect and they're like, well, I've seen 18 million dead shows. Oh, wow. <laughs> When you find the time, <laughs> and they have a tape of every one of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I guess there's that thing too, the taping. You know, because that's because we never got any initially any reaction from the industry that just sort of looked at us like what? The way that we the word spread about us was not because of us. Well, I mean, I guess partially it was, but also people taping the shows, and and so we'd arrive. We've never been to Boston. We don't have an album out, but we'd get to, to you know some Boston show and. And be playing a little club, and then everyone in the place is singing along with us. Yeah. Or play, you know, go and do some, do a university show in Burlington and be playing, and then everyone's singing back at us. Lord, I've never been to Burlington. How do you know? I got this tape, and I got that tape. This tape. So I guess there's that similarity, too. Mm-hmm. Do you have taper sections? At the- yeah, we, we, don't, we don't have, I think we might have, start putting one out this, if, they get, if the mics get too too much in the way, but I don't think, we, we don't have a, a, we don't have a board feed but we do have we do let people come in and bring microphones oh that's good okay yeah it's a good thing i I mean everybody had had thought well and and, you know maybe that's what contributed to the dead not being a great selling band uh uh, record wise but you know i mean on the other hand they certainly sold out every concert for what 20 years or something like that yeah 30 or whatever yeah but you know but i guess the the thing um The thing is uh, that they, with them, or maybe there was a sim- I don't know if they just didn't like the studio, or maybe their fans just didn't like studio records. The things with us is that that I, I, uh, we love going into the studio, and especially this last time, even though we were, we sort of weren't there. But what comes out of it is very different from what we do live. It's very similar, but also very different, you know. And so that I haven't felt that there's going to be much. Uh, I think the people that have the tapes and the people who buy the bootleg CDs are going to buy our CDs too. Yeah. yeah. I really feel like that. I feel like it does more good than it does bad. And uh, finally, for another story I've been working on, I've been asking everybody I interview, have you seen the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and what do you think of the idea? I haven't seen the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I think it's interesting because um, the main reason, it was, like, it was funny seeing all these rebels. In the, at least a lot of the people that in their in their youth were rebels, crazy, nuts, you know, screaming, you know, throwing their finger up, saying "fuck you," and now they're all standing up there going, you know, it's about time that we were honored and, and we or that that we had a place, you know, to, to call our own. And like the, the, it went from being rebels to being like a happy rock and roll family, um, <laughs> which is fine. I mean, it's cool. I mean. I don't really think about it either way. I guess it's, I have no opinion. I have, I haven't, I have no urge to go there. Uh, but that may, that may be my own ignorance that's, that's uh, led me to say that. With no doubt it is my own ignorance has led me to say that. Okay. But I have no burning desire to go there. Okay. I won't travel across um, uh, fields and mountains to, to, to get there. Can I will, however, travel a long way to go to a small village in Italy just to have a good, Damn pesto. Uh, all right. Uh, care to hazard a guess on uh, 23 years down the road whether you're going to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? 23 years down the road. Right, it's, uh, it's will the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame exist anymore or will it be a, an empty building with uh, rats and a growing homeless problem? <laughs> <laughs> Where, one wonders. Uh, so I wonder what, what will be... I don't know. What, 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 I hadn't really considered that being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Well, you, you got a you got a ways to go. I mean, yeah, you we know, got a year way. wise. So, uh, right, you have to wait twenty five years from your first album. So that's why I ask. You know, yeah. just just wondering. Um, anyway, this is this has been uh, really interesting.
enjoyable. Do you have anything else uh, you want me to tell people that we haven't talked about? No, but thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed talking to you, too. Okay, and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Great, Mark. Take care. All the best. Same to you. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tapes Archive podcast. Please remember, you can always find more information about the show and the individual episodes at our website, thetapesarchive.com. Until next time, the vault is closed.